Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Brother John. Appreciate those songs. Appreciate the prayers and the participation on your behalf of the worship this morning. It always is a an honor to be able to be uh, able to stand before you and to proclaim the truth. And uh, I count it a privilege, and I'm so thankful for this opportunity. As we take a look at our passage that was read this morning in 1 John chapter 2, uh, beginning there in verse 7, uh, you know, we've, we've covered the book of John. This is John, the same writer, the Apostle John. And we know that this writing is after, of course, the Gospel account, and he is writing to Christians. And so it's no wonder that many of the things, the images, the things that he says or writes, uh, would, would collaborate with the book of John. So as we take a look at this, and he writes here, Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. And these words and these phrases are very similar to the things that we saw in the Gospel account of John. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, as we read in John 1, uh, verses 1 through 3. So, you know, <clears throat> we, are, we are getting the feel that he's talking about uh, the, the Word the, that was made flesh and dwelt among us. John chapter 1, verse 14. And, and all of the things that are contained therein in the word or the gospel account according to John. And so he's saying that I'm right not I'm, uh, there is no new commandment unto you but an old commandment which you have known from the beginning. And when, and so you know he's saying these things and it, it certainly comes to my mind well what is it? You know what are you trying to convey? To us, And so we have to take in the context to further our understanding. He says again, a new commandment. So now he's talking about something different. I write unto you which thing is true in him and in you because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. And what we uh, think about what he's saying here is, uh, it could be a couple of things. Number one, uh, there is the Old, Te Old Testament, the Old Commandments that were followed uh, by the Jews. Um, and, and so there's, there's things that could certainly be said about that. But because the Savior has arrived on the scene, Jesus has arrived on the scene, that old law uh, was put to death on the cross. And now a new law or a new commandment, that is the gospel of Jesus Christ, has now been put into effect. We certainly can't understand it from that point of view. But there's also another point of view in that when a person uh, decides to obey the gospel, we understand it as they go into that watery grave and they rise to walk in newness of life. It's baptism, right? Because they put that old man of sin to death. It's behind us. It's, it's put away. And now we are walking forward, walking as 1 John chapter 1 says, we're walking in the light as He is in the light. Uh, we want to just briefly go back over there and, and take a look at a, a, a couple of things. Uh, it says there in verse 5 that God is light and in Him is no darkness. We are thereby encouraged and edified in verse 7 to walk in that light. Which means, I mean, the illustration is, and it seems to be pretty straightforward, that if we're going to be like the light of God, we're going to have to walk in His ways. I don't think there's any, anybody surprised by that, is there? A, it, it seems pretty straightforward. Amen. We're just going to have to do what God says. Now, what is the context about these old commandments, these new commandments? Well, we get more information as we get into verse 9, 10, 11. He that saith he is in the light, okay, he's, who says he's a Christian, doing what God says, and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. Now, when we bring in the idea of hating the brother, uh, that helps us connect with some things that we've studied in John, the Gospel account of John. But hang on to that for just a minute. Let's read uh, verse 10. He that loveth his brother, aha, 
He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. Well, you know, we gather this context and now we have everything that he's saying, as we've said, there seems to be a very strong tie to something that we've already read and studied in the Gospel account of John. But let's read verse 11. But he that hateth or detesteth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. Uh, I can't imagine what blindness is like. I don't want to. Uh, our sight, even, even though I need corrective lenses, is so precious. Don't you agree? I mean, can, has anybody here been blinded for a short period of time? If you have, I'd, I'd like for you to share what that's like. My, my brother, has, you have? In one, in one eye. In one eye. For about 30 seconds, it just went gray. Just one eye? Is, yeah. yeah, Ben was too. I had double vision. Double vision. That's, that's, that's hard. That's twice as good. <laughs> well, the whole point, and I think we all can understand and comprehend that, yeah, the blindness is not something to be desired. Now, if we put that in context with what the Scripture is saying here, one that hates their brother is blind. In other words, that is something, hating the brother is nothing that we should desire. Am I right? Isn't that what it's saying? Now, with the things that have been said here, I go back to John chapter 13. That's where we should go. John chapter 13, and I encourage you to turn in your Bibles there with me as we take a look at what the passage says. And what we have to do is keep in context also what was taking place in John chapter 13. Do you remember that? It was the washing... Jesus, the Lord, the Messiah, the Son of God, washed the feet of the apostles. Fantastic. And he said his purpose was to be an example unto them. Right? He says, uh, what I'm doing is to serve as an example to you. Remember the exchange with Peter? Peter didn't want to have anything to do with it. And Jesus said, well, if you don't want to have anything to do with it, then I'm not going to have anything to do with you. I'm paraphrasing, of course, but wow, strong language there. But it's important for us to understand the lesson that is conveyed, the message. If we don't want to do what Jesus says, then he don't want anything to do with us. Now, what does that say? We better want to do and submit ourselves to the will of the Son of God, Jesus the Christ. Because within that, not only is there this concept and this idea of obligation, right? But we also receive the blessing. Isn't that right with Jesus? That's right. You know it's right. But I want to draw your minds and attention to beginning in verse 33. He says, little children. Now does that sound familiar with what John writes? Uh, we'll see it next week. Little children, yet a little while I'm with you, you shall seek me. And as I said unto the Jews, whether I go, you cannot come. And now I say to you, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. And if you don't want to have that, then Jesus doesn't want anything to do with you. It's just that simple. It seems hard, but that is the reality of it. Now, Let's put that on the back burner for just a moment. And we're going to go back to 1 John. And we take a look again at verse 7. He says, I write no new commandment unto you, but there's an old commandment. And you know about it. You've known about it from the beginning. Let's go back then now to Matthew chapter 22. Right? Because I think this pulls into the same discussion and argument that we want to have this... Not argument. A sermon or lesson that we want to have this morning. In Matthew chapter 22, we get over to verse 34. It says the Pharisees heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence. That is, Jesus had. Uh, and they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him. 
So now we see the purpose of this lawyer asking this question was to tempt God. Really? That's how much they hated him. I'm glad it's there because it helped. I can feel their unlove, right? Uh, and so he was tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And we know what these are. Jesus replies to him, he says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, with all of thy soul, and with all of thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. Alright, there is a lot in that verse that we could talk about and, and gain wisdom and understanding from. But that's not, that's not what's on our plate for this morning. But rather, take a look at verses 39 and 40. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now it was not unusual in that day and time for Jesus when he referred to the law and prophets it was the collection of the Old Testament. That's right. He's talking about Genesis through Malachi. Those were the two laws that were the most significant and if you could follow those two you were, you were able to accomplish success for God. That's pretty impressive. So if those were the two commandments, and I'm thinking, well, if you're to love your neighbor as yourself, I mean, that's, uh, that's, that, that's everybody. Who does that leave out? Because it's been demonstrated to us in other passages, like, uh, you know, the, the fellow that, um, it, it slips my mind exactly which one it is, uh, the, um, the Good Samaritan, that's it. You remember the, the fellow that, that was robbed and kicked off to the side in the gutter, if you will, and, and it was the Good Samaritan that came by. And even though there was uh, divisiveness and, and division, a chism between the Jews and the, the Samaritans, it that, that didn't matter to the Samaritan. He saw his duty as fellow man and perhaps as understanding these precepts and concepts in God's law that he had a duty to take care of that poor individual kicked to the side. Now that's love. And that's awesome. You know, it's, it feels good to know there's people like that. And, and that should satisfy us, right? These are the two great commandments. We should go home now. We should just be happy and, try to, and strive for those two things. Except that, as Jesus writes to us in John chapter 13, there's a new commandment. Now, why was it necessary to give a new commandment? I mean, doesn't love your neighbor pretty much satisfy everything? But there's a new commandment that the disciples of Christ, the followers of Christ, which we know as Christians, now need to love their brother, their brethren. Now, we're not talking about a physical connection, but we're talking about those who are gathered together for the same purpose. We know what it is. We don't have to try to, to dump some kind of foreign doctrine into this. He's talking about Christians loving Christians here. But this is a new commandment, and the purpose of this commandment is that all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Well, a couple of things. First of all, let's talk about the word love. In the Greek, in the Greek, there are like what four different Greek words that have all been translated in our text as love. <laughs> so what are they? Well, there's brotherly love, phileo. Uh, there's eros, which is the the kind of love, the intimate love that a man and woman have for one another. And and then there's agape, which is the word that we're talking about here. Agape love. This is a love in which it is a selfless love. It is a love in which we are more worried or more concerned about the betterment or the success of another individual. I'll give you an example. For God so loved the world. It wasn't a brotherly love. It wasn't an intimate sexual kind of love. But it was one in which he was more interested in the betterment and the outcome of his creation, mankind. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, 
I don't think any of us have gone to that level to where we have sacrificed the most beloved offspring that we have. Right? I'm not sure that we can wrap our minds around that kind of feeling. And I don't think we're supposed to. But we need to be matching that kind of love. God agape the world. Well, what did He have to gain for that? He had nothing to gain. He just simply did it for the betterment of His creation. Now brethren, we are very special just in that. God gave His Son for all of us. That's fantastic. You know, in other passages it says He died for the whole world. Fantastic. Now can you imagine somebody with that kind of selfless love and then there are those who reject it? Who turned their back on that gift? Yes, they exist. We call it the world. The dark and condemned world. They have rejected that kind of love. We know in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, a similar passage there where it says that God commended His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It sort of takes it to a new level, right? Not only did He just simply die for us, but even though we were against God, that we had transgressed His laws, that we had no favor with Him, He still loved us because He sacrificed His Son. It takes it to a new level, doesn't it? And yet God is just waiting, waiting for us to embrace that kind of love. Well, that's the kind of love that was written in John chapter 13. Was it? I want to go back to that for just a minute. John chapter 13. Uh, <clears throat> Verse 34, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. And we know what that means. He gave it up. He gave it His all. A sacrificial love. And that's how we are to love our brethren. You know what this says to me is that in light of the greatest commandments of all, that is to love God and to love your neighbor, that's not good enough for the Christian. We have to strive for something greater. And that's embracing this kind of love. There's some very uh, good passages with regard to love. Uh, uh, let's just entertain what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 for just a moment. We know there that this love, this agape, suffers long. It's patient. That's right. Love is kind. Now when we talk about this, and the very subject that we're talking about, which is loving our brother, uh, I know we use this passage a lot in the marriage ceremony, but this word love is... is is more grand than that. And today I'm asking you to take these aspects, these characteristics, and apply them to our brotherly love, the love of the brethren. Love is patient. It suffers long. Love is kind. Love envieth not. In other words, it's generous. It's a generous love. Love is not puffed up. It's not prideful. It's an element of humility. And it does not behave unseemly for an inappropriate purpose. Love does not seek her own. It's not out for our own benefit. Remember, love is, is selfless. It's the idea of betterment of somebody else. Uh, it is not easily provoked. That, there's a whole lesson just in that. This love is not easily provoked. It thinks no evil. There's no guile. There's no deceit or lies intended in that kind of love. And it does not rejoice in iniquity. Now I want to sit on that for just a moment. True love does not rejoice in iniquity. Well, 
brethren, when we're talking about loving the, loving the brethren, we're talking about this selfless, respectful love. In other words, we're not going to be backbiting or gossiping or tearing down. Uh, we, we definitely, as brethren, are, are not in the uh, business, if you will, or should not be doing things like uh, these, as I said, gossiping, backbiting, tearing down, negativity, right? But keep in mind, you know, when God loved us, and He, you know, I, 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 there's a very strong element here that we have to understand because I think a lot of people misunderstand the idea of love. They're, they think in terms of, well, I, I've just got to love my brethren in spite of their weaknesses and overlook their, um, their problems. But is that really godly? I want us to think about what the scripture says in Acts chapter 17 and verse 30. Because, uh, I'm sorry, verse 30. And at the times of this ignorance God winked at. But now he commandeth all men everywhere to repent, to change. Why? He loved us. Doesn't that mean He's going to just forgive us and overlook the things that we've done in our lives? He's going to look, uh, overlook those sins? Absolutely not. Unless we do what He asks us to do that remedies that problem. But God is a just God. And He's going to see to it that things are carried out in a just judgment, a just way. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means all of us are deserving of a, of a condemnation in hell. That's what it means. But God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish. There's an opportunity there. We've talked about that the last week or the last couple of weeks. Opportunity. We should. There, nobody should perish. But as we look at the context of John chapter 3, we've got to do what God says. John chapter 3, we have to be born of the water and the Spirit. We have to be baptized. Jesus, in fact, the greatest uh, commission, as He was about to leave this earth, He told His apostles what to do. And, and He told them out of love for creation. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Remember, Jesus came to this earth to do what? Set up a kingdom? An earthly kingdom? Of course not. It was a spiritual kingdom. But he was very clear. He says, I am here to seek and to save that which is lost. Why? Why, Jesus? You, you came down out of heaven. There's beautiful songs about him coming down out of heaven. I gave my life for thee. Why did he leave that glory circled throne? Because he loved us. He loved us enough to say, look, you're in error and you need to get it right. I love you and I'm telling you that out of element of love. So as much as we understand love as, as being patient and kind and it's generous and it's not uh, prideful, it doesn't do things unseemly, it doesn't seek our own and it's not easily provoked, there's no... There's no uh, error or guile found in that love, but love does not rejoice in iniquity. So as much as this lesson is all about being the kind of brotherly love that is, the old kind of love is just not good enough for Christians. There had to be a new commandment. And if we don't want to follow that commandment, then Jesus doesn't want anything to do with us because we're not walking in the line. But that new commandment of love is this selfless, respectful love that Jesus was trying to convey in John chapter 13 by the washing of the apostles' feet, being kind like that. But he was not going to put up with error. And I tell you what, he loved, he loved Judas. But that didn't excuse his error. Jesus loves us. The point where He gave Himself for us, but that does not excuse, excuse the way that we live when we live in error, when we harm our brethren, when we let brethren do things they ought not to do, which is harmful to their souls. <laughs> There's kind of a two-way street going on here. Some might say, well, why is He preaching this lesson? Somebody, I, that's just what was next 
in line with what I've been doing. But it is a good sermon and a good principle. Now, we take a look and examine ourselves in light of what has been ex exposed or expounded on today. <coughs> kind of brother have I been? I want us to think about that. We're going to sing this song of encouragement. Well, let me handle a couple of things before we stand and sing. First of all, if you want to embrace the love that God has shown us, we do it by obeying what our Lord has asked us to do. That is to be baptized in water for the remission of our sins. It starts with the faith in Jesus as the Son of God. It leads us to repentance. God demands that we repent. That's what He wants for all men everywhere, right? Acts 17.30. And then through that change of heart, we're going to be baptized. Why? For the remission of sins. That's how Peter says in Acts 2.38. That's how it was explained to Paul in Acts 22, verse 16. And a whole host, uh, Romans chapter 6. We go down to put that old man of sin to death and put it behind us so that we can move forward. If you've not done that, we invite you to obey what the gospel says, to enjoy the fruits of being a Christian, and to embrace the love of God. Most of us in here are already Christians. We understand that. Now, now it's time for us to examine ourselves and how we conduct our lives. Are we being faithful? Are we living the kind of life as a brother in Christ that we should and displaying the kind of love uh, to our fellow, fellow brethren? Are we? We stand ready to assist you in whatever way that you need, whatever prayers you feel like can be beneficial to you. It is our honor to go to God's throne on your behalf. If we can assist you today, won't you respond to the Lord's invitation as together we stand and sing.